All right, let's go ahead and get started. You can sit down, uh, sir. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everybody. If you're not here for a talk on AI and large language models, you're in the wrong place, but you're welcome to stay. Uh, hopefully, we have a good time. So just wanted to kind of do a quick survey here, show of hands. If you would consider yourself a, uh, a seasoned user of large language models, you use them in your day-to-day -day workflows, you may be hosting your own models, fine-tuning things. Hands, I see a couple. If you would consider yourself a dabbler in LLMs, you played around with ChatGPT, written some poems, had a little fun. Uh, more hands, all right. And if you can spell AI, all right. <laughs> so this is, this is for you all. This is a, a beginner session, really trying to uh, demystify a lot of these terms in the, the generative AI space. Uh, for you seasoned professionals out there, you may not walk out of here with any new knowledge, but hopefully uh, you have a little bit of fun and maybe some ways to explain things to your loved ones who uh, aren't quite as, as tech savvy as you. Uh, so introduce myself, I'm Baron Stone. Uh, I work for Defense Unicorns with all of these fine people over here. Uh, I'm a product manager and I lead our uh, AI uh, development team. Uh, so as the name Defense Unicorns uh, implies, uh, we are a defense uh, company, a startup, uh, and we build open source tools uh, to support national security missions. And so my team develops a tool called Leapfrog AI, which I'll talk to a little more uh, at the end. Uh, but just quick background on me, uh, formally educated and schooled in electrical engineering. Uh, when I did my master's, I uh, was doing a lot of machine learning work, but that was in 2016, uh, and a lot has happened since then, so I'm not that old, but I feel like a dinosaur compared to uh, everything that's come out with transformers and generative AI in the past few years. Uh, uh, side hustle. Uh, I serve as a reserve officer in the US Air Force. I uh, just got back from two weeks out of the Pentagon last week. Uh, and then when I have any free time left, uh, I teach uh, online courses with my wife, Olivia, uh, on LinkedIn Learning, been doing that for about a, a decade or so. Uh, and I mentioned that last part because I am very passionate about teaching and I love to be able to try to take these complex topics uh, and break them down so that anybody can understand them. And with that comes my disclaimer for this talk, uh, a technical talk, is don't expect 100% technical accuracy here. Uh, again, this is a beginner talk, and our focus is on concepts and trying to get that understanding uh, and not so much technical implementation. So I will use uh, a lot of analogies uh, and relate a lot of things to the way, you know, talk about a language model learning things the way a human learns things. Uh, I promise you the neurons in this sack of meat uh, don't function the same way as the, you know, ones and zeros in that computer. Uh, but we can use those kind of analogies to get a common understanding. So uh, before you, you know, tell me I'm wrong out back, I'm, I'm getting ahead of you here. Uh, and I do have a lot to cover here, so I'll ask to, to save questions to the end. Uh, hopefully I have a little time, uh, and always happy to, to chat with folks afterwards as well. So AI, artificial intelligence, means a lot of different things, uh, and there's a lot of hype here. So if you haven't seen one of these graphs before, uh, Gartner puts these out uh, for the hype cycle uh, of different emerging technologies. So how they, over the life cycle of that technology, kind of the public perception and hype goes. Uh, so this is one that they created for uh, artificial intelligence. So each of these little dots up here uh, represent different flavors or subgenres of AI, if you will. Uh, and we go from left to right, uh, time axis, uh, and then expectations uh, along the vertical axis. Uh, and so whenever we have a you know, new innovation happens, uh, as people learn about it, they get super excited, and we hit a peak of inflated expectations. It's gonna solve the world's problems. Then they realize, well, maybe it's not as everything we thought it was cracked up to be, and we sink into the trough of disillusionment before eventually things mature, we pass the slope of enlightenment uh, onto the plateau of productivity. Uh, I wanna call out just sort of two points to kind of anchor you here in, in just an understanding. Uh, one is over there on the far right, kind of eking up onto that plateau of productivity, uh, and that's computer vision. Uh, so this is something like, and we'll talk about a little more, uh, been around for, for several decades. The technology matured, and it's to the point where we don't even think about how we're using it. You pull out your phone, snap a QR code, boom, computer vision. Uh, you push auto driving on your Tesla, boom, computer vision. Uh, you walk in the grocery store and the security camera's tracking your face, boom, computer vision. So it's everywhere and it really has matured to that level of, of usefulness. Now, I'll call out one other thing up here at the very tippity top uh, of our peak of inflated expectations and that's generative AI, uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so there's a lot of uh, companies out there, a lot of energy and a lot of money being invested into the generative AI space. Uh, I'll actually even say, uh, going back to that chart, this was from July of last year, and I feel like even sometimes we might have started sinking off of that peak expectations and drifting into the trough of disillusionment 
with certain things that generative AI can do. Uh, but lots of money uh, going into it out there. Before we jump into generative AI, I think it helps to take a quick step uh, back in time and just sort of understand how did we get here? Uh, you know, how did we get to AI uh, in general? Uh, so I'm gonna go back to the 1940s uh, to this lad, uh, Dr. Alan Turing. If you've been to the UK recently, you might recognize him as the guy on the 50 pound note. Uh, if you went to the cinemas back in 2014, you might have seen Benedict Cumberbatch portray him uh, in the imita Im ugh, imitation game. That's, that's a tough one to say. Uh, great movie, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. Uh, but that movie centers around his contributions back in World War II. The Nazis were using this little box in the bottom right there, the Enigma machine, to encode their messages that they would send out over radio transmissions to their boats and submarines. Uh, the Allies could intercept those messages, but they couldn't decrypt them within time to do anything uh, useful with that information. So Alan Turing and his team built the large system you see there called the bomb, which was able to, a big electromechanical computer, uh, decrypt those messages fast enough, provide actionable insight, save countless lives, uh, so that was a, a major contribution there. So he's well known for that, but that was not the only thing he did. Uh, in fact, before the war, he was already well established uh, as a leader in the field of theoretical computer science, uh, came up with a concept uh, that he referred to as the Turing machine. Uh, this is a, a theoretical sort of abstract model of computation, not anything physically realizable, it involves an infinitely long tape uh, with ones and zeros and data. Uh, but mathematically showing out a, a device or a way that you can um, implement different types of algorithms. Uh, and then after the war, this is where we get into the, the AI side of things, uh, he turned his attention to what he referred to as machine intelligence. Uh, the term artificial intelligence uh, came a few years later, uh, but he was you know, toying around with the idea of like, can machines think, and how do we know if a machine can think? Uh, and that's where he came up with a thought experiment called the Turing test. Uh, which basically plays out simply, you have a human player uh, who through some sort of interface, you know, maybe a, a chat keyboard or whatever, uh, is talking to an entity uh, on the other side. That entity could be another human, or it could be a, a an, you know, machine uh, intelligence. And that that human can't distinguish whether they're talking to a human or machine, you could kind of reasonably say, well, this machine is uh, intelligent. Uh, and so that's actually something that's kind of a, a thought that's carried forward, and there's been lots of challenges over recent years uh, trying to you know, create a, a AI systems that'll pass the Turing test, getting kind of scary close uh, with some of the models we see today. So again, Alan Turing, very theoretical. The, as you can see in the middle, the machinery that was available at the time in the 1940s, that technology was not anything that was gonna be able to produce an AI uh, like what he was envisioning. And so there were some te technological advancements that needed to happen. Uh, fortunately, in the late 40s, we had the invention of the transistor, so we were able to kind of replace vacuum tubes and other electromechanical relays that were being used in those large computers. Uh, throughout the 50s, uh, researchers started developing integrated circuits where we could put lots of these transistors together onto a single board. Uh, thank you, NASA, in the 1960s, the Apollo program actually like, really accelerated development in integrated circuits because they needed that new technology to work uh, for the guidance computers uh, on the Apollo mission. So uh, that was kind of a forcing function to inject, inject a lot of money and research into that realm. Uh, by the time the 70s rolled around, we started seeing commercial microprocessors, uh, and then in the 80s, we had personal computers and Bill Gates just seductively lounging uh, on his. <laughs> so the, the most fantastic picture ever. So we've had this you know, huge progression in, in computing capability that we have. Now, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, well, researchers always come up with good ideas. Uh, a couple of folks at IBM uh, and Carnegie Mellon said, hey, let's build a supercomputer to play chess. Uh, and so they did that, and uh, they called it Deep Blue. Uh, you might have remembered this. Uh, back in 1996, they challenged Garry Kasparov, the current world champion, uh, to a game of, or a match of chess. Uh, Deep Blue won two of the games, but overall in that match, Kasparov came out ahead. Not to be ejected, the researchers went back to their lab, started tweaking their algorithms, throwing some more RAM in there. Uh, and then the next year in 97, they had a rematch, and this time Deep Blue actually came out ahead. And so this was kind of a milestone event of, you know, a computer developed intelligence beating the best human in the world uh, at a very specific task, in this case, chess. And of course, the media grabbed that and just kind of blew it up and, you know, said Skynet's coming or, you know, uh, all the hyperbole. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of value here. Um, one thing to note is the, the type of machine or the type of AI that they were using in this uh, is not like the type of AI we think of today or like the generative AI we're talking about. Uh, it was what was known as an expert system. So it's basically the researchers got a whole bunch of really good 
chess players together and they came up with a bunch of like if then rules to try to say how would I decide what moves to make, program those in there and then the uh, system could search out a bunch of possible moves, look kind of look forward far enough based on those roles, make good decisions. So you did have very much a human developed algorithm for this, uh, but it was developed to, to solve this particular problem. Uh, as we roll into the current uh, century, we start to see the, the emergence or the real uh, flourishing of neural networks and, and deep learning capabilities. Uh, one of those, recommender systems. So back in uh, 2006, Netflix put out a million dollar prize challenge to say, hey, who could develop a better recommendation algorithm for our videos than what we currently have? Uh, it took a couple years, but that was eventually claimed in 2009. So if you've Netflix and chilled lately and got good recommendations, you can you know, thank the research that went on back in those days. Um, an example of you know, technology that's just sort of become part of our everyday life. Uh, computer vision really sort of took off uh, going into the 2010s. There was a, a ImageNet was a large uh, data set out there for training computer vision models. Uh, and then sort of like the, through the early 10s, there was a, like an arms race of people developing different types of convolutional neural networks and something. Uh, trying to be better and better uh, at computer vision. And again, now that's kind of reaching into that mainstream uh, capability. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, sort of a, a callback to the, the chess match with Kasparov, a uh, team at DeepMind decided to develop a system they referred to as AlphaGo uh, to play Go. Now, I, I, I will admit, I don't know all the rules of Go, but I just know that there's a lot more uh, board space and search space of possible combinations on the board than chess which makes it increasingly more complicated in, in the, the methods, the expert systems they were using for Deep Blue wouldn't translate over to effectively solve this problem uh, in the game of Go. So they took a different approach. Uh, they did what's now known as adversarial network uh, to train a model. So they taught their AI ba the basic rules to play Go and then had it play hundreds of millions you know, of matches against itself. Uh, and during that time it learned and developed strategies and set, found what worked and what didn't work. So, the machine learning in the same way as a human you might learn, right? How do you get good at Go? You go play hundreds of games with your friends uh, and, and you know, learn from that experience. The machine's just able to do it on a much larger scale, much faster. Uh, and an interesting thing was there were some emergent strategies that came out of that where when they played uh, experts, the humans were like, hey, I've never seen anyone ever do this before. That doesn't make sense. You, you know, get beat a few, a few moves later and then you realize, oh, well, that's a, that's a you know, unique strategy. So uh, kind of a neat thing that, that came out of that. Um, but in 2016, uh, was able to beat the, uh, the world champion and go with that algorithm. And then we get to 2017. Uh, and this is sort of a pivotal moment. Uh, a bunch of researchers at Google put out a paper uh, titled Attention is All You Need. Uh, and this is where they described the transformer network, which really sort of forms the foundation for all of the big generative AI, the explosion we've seen over the past few years. Uh, so this is where the large language models, you know, things like ChatGPT, uh, we have text to image generation models like Stable Diffusion and Midjourney, uh, and like even Meta's, or no, OpenAI is putting out uh, text to video models. Uh, Sora came out a, a couple months ago. Um, you can do text to audio. There's, there's all kinds of, you know, way more than this, but this ability to generatively produce new content, um, really kind of the, the foundation of that goes back to, to 2017. So that brings us to the present, uh, in the end of our history lesson. One second. All right, so we're gonna be focused now, let's talk about uh, large language models specifically. There's, you know, generative AI is very broad in the way that AI is very broad. Um, but just to put it in super simple terms for the people who spell AI and that's it, uh, the way you interact or what a large language model can do is as a user, you're able to submit a text prompt. So a natural language, you know, type a message like you were typing it to your friend. And then the large language model takes that and then generates an output response back to you and then you can continue the conversation uh, over and over and maintains context. So it's, it's, a, it's a chat bot, uh, effectively. It can seem kind of magical, uh, and so now let's kind of take a little peek behind the curtain to see how does that chat bot uh, imitate sort of the, the natural language response you might see from a human uh, person. A human person, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, so first, let's, uh, let's talk about how does this uh, LLM interpret or see the world, uh, and this is through a concept of tokens. So if we were to give it uh, an input sentence here, we're off to see the wizard. Uh, it's gonna run, run that through something called a tokenizer or a tokenization process, uh, and the output of that is we basically break that sequence up into discrete uh, elements uh, referred to as tokens, and this is sort of the fundamental piece of, of information and how the LLM operates. 
Now in practice, uh, tokenization can make it a little more complex than what we have here, just simply breaking up by words. For example, something like we might be broken into three tokens for we, apostrophe, re. We're just gonna keep it simple with words for these examples. Um, but that's, that is the way you think of it. This is, you know, now the LLM has information to process on. So what can we do with those tokens? Uh, well, one thing is we need to kind of establish uh, a relationship with the, between these different tokens, which represent different words or, or elements. Uh, and the way we can do that is with something called uh, embeddings. So let's say we've got tokens here representing the various characters from the Wizard of Oz, uh, and I've laid them up uh, on, a, on a, you know, the graph here uh, with evil uh, on one end of the spectrum and good on the other. And I, you can question my decision on where to put them on here, uh, but I'm standing by it. So this gives us one, you know, one dimension view of how these different tokens uh, relate to each other. Now these characters are more than one dimensional, so let's add a second dimension. Uh, I picked tall and short, uh, and then we can spread the uh, characters out uh, along those dimensions as well. So now we have characters mapped out on a two-dimensional plane. Uh, with a two-dimensional plane, we can represent where they are with a two-dimensional vector. So for example, this little munchkin down in the bottom might be represented by the vector 0.12 and negative 0.55. Uh, and this ve vector is what we refer to as an embedding. So as another example, the tree up there would have its own embedding vector and this uh, projects or puts it into this kind of embedding space where closer items are near each other. Uh, so for example, in this, in this case, we can see our uh, you know, married crew uh, uh, with Dorothy and the, the three hanging out together over there, so they're close together in terms of these two dimensions, whereas you know, Glendon, uh, the witch of the West, even though they're both the same height, because they're you know, very good and very evil, uh, in this you know, two-dimensional uh, embedding space, they're still very far apart. If we were to add, let's say, a third dimension to this uh, for gender, so you know, male and female on kind of each end of that spectrum, suddenly the witch and Glinda might move closer together uh, in that uh, dimension of the vector space, whereas Dorothy and her you know, uh, travel partners would spread apart. So these, these vector spaces, you know, trying to visualize anything beyond three dimensions as humans uh, doesn't work well. Um, so in practice in the LLMs, these spaces, you, know, you have hundreds of dimensions or, or often thousands, you know, even to tens of thousands, of dimensions. Uh, those dimensions are also not necessarily, you know, the way I just described, like I picked good and evil for this example and tall and short for this example. Uh, they aren't explicitly defined by a human for training the model. These dimensions as part of the developing and training this process sort of emerge from the model uh, training looking at all of this data. And so you, it's never actually 100% clear what those dimensions are. They're not as explicit uh, as in this example, uh, but there's often you can kind of suss out um, certain characteristics. Um, but the point of this is that it puts us into a vector space where semantically similar uh, items are located uh, near each other. And this can be applied to individual words, we can apply it to phrases. In fact, we can apply this uh, concept of embeddings to even data that's not text-based. So uh, other, other types of data formats, uh, same concept uh, can be applied. All right, so we've got, uh, with embeddings, a way to take those tokens and then kind of uh, you know, map them into a place where we've got that semantic similarity. Now. How do we go about actually generating text uh, as a large language model? Uh, and this is where we're going to talk about the, uh, the transformer. Uh, and so this is the, the kind of scary looking diagram uh, from that attention is all you need uh, paper. Uh, recommend reading the paper. It's not too, too terribly long. Um, but if I was to give you, I'll give you a three word summary of what's going on here. Input, math, output. So. <laughs> I joke, um, but rather than trying to kind of walk through everything in this block diagram, uh, for the conceptual, let's walk through an example and kind of see how, you know, how an LLM might go through uh, the generation process. So fundamentally, what, a, what an LLM is doing, it is really taking an, in a sequence of tokens that are at the input and trying to predict what is the next token or what should the next uh, most likely token be uh, in that sequence. Uh, so if we have the sequence follow the yellow brick, the most likely next token would be road, right. Uh, and you all know that from you know, a lifetime of training and seeing the Wizard of Oz. Uh, so you've, you've chosen that as the most likely option uh, and you are correct. That said, there were other, you know, other words that you could have picked that could have made sense uh, within this context, follow the yellow brick lane, path, street, whatever. Uh, and so by taking in you know, all of these input tokens, 
going through our, our transformer architecture, the output we get is this probability distribution that says road is the most likely, and we've got other options here. Uh, and then we'll pick uh, uh, the token we want to use uh, based on that probability. And there's some parameters and things you can tune in there to skew the probabilities uh, with temperature, but that's, that's the general uh, concept. And then we're just picking the next word. Uh, so to kind of peek a little bit more behind the scenes there, uh, as part of the process, so how did we get you know, from, uh, from input tokens to an output distribution? Uh, well, well, first we can take those tokens uh, and we can get those corresponding embedding vectors uh, for all of those tokens. So that gives us this array of tokens and you know, we, we see where they fall into that uh, embedding space with their similarities. Then I'm gonna gloss over this, but let's just say there's a whole lot of, uh, of linear algebra and math going on here, applying uh, weights and, and doing just matrix math with all these kind of pre-trained matrices, which at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get a, a vector uh, in, in the embedding space that represents what is that most likely output um, look like. And then we can take that, get it out of the embedding space back into token space through some more math, and then through some more math and something called a softmax function, that's how we can get that probability distribution and ultimately choose what that next token's gonna be. Uh, one of the interesting things that makes these transformer models uh, unique or able to do what they do uh, is this concept of attention. And so it's, we're not just looking at like sequentially kind of going down these tokens one to the next to the next to the next and deciding what comes next. We're really evaluating all of these tokens together in parallel and we're able to look at uh, or extract kind of contextual information and, and you know, what tokens are more important or what tokens might be related to each other. Uh, and that information feeds into all of the maths uh, in the decision making process. So here we might see that, for example, yellow and brick uh, position wise are next to each other. Uh, and that's, you know, there's a, there's a relationship there between yellow describing brick. Um, with a longer sentence, you can start drawing out more relationships. But that, that type of information uh, and looking at the sequence as a whole uh, is part of what makes these, uh, these things tick. So we've picked road uh, as our next sequence. Now if we want to continue generating, well, as we go to generate the next sequence, you'll see we're, now we're taking all uh, five of those previously generated tokens and those are going into the model and being used to predict that next uh, sequence. And in this case, probably gonna be maybe a punctuation point, but it could be some other words you know, with their respective probabilities. Uh, and the thing that's important here, again, like I said, we're, we're looking at all of those tokens that come in uh, for this processing. These are what are known uh, to be in, in the context window or within the current context uh, of the model. Uh, and why this is important uh, is the context window is finite. Uh, now Google might disagree with me, they've been putting out some research on a infinite context, uh, some compression stuff, but in general there's, you know, there's finite uh, size to these context windows. So let's imagine you, know, you and I are having a long conversation. We've been talking hours, hours and hours. Uh, I may not remember what you know, we started talking out you know, back at the beginning of the conversation. I only have so much memory as, you know, in my head. Um, and so if you try to ask me questions or relate to something you know, we talked about three hours ago, it may not register and it, it's, you know, it's out of my memory. Uh, the output from the LLM works the same way. So, we have uh, that context window, you can, you know, in simple terms, think of it almost like a sliding window where all of the uh, information that's been, you know, provided as input prompts as well as the corresponding generative output just kind of continues to, to stack up and stack up. And all of that is being uh, used in consideration every time you're going through that token generation process. So you need all of that context and you're able to, you know, it's looking across that whole context window uh, for those relationships and using that to pick the token. Now, thing is, if your conversation goes on too long or you, know, you run out of space, uh, that's when you start to forget context. And in this case, if you've ever you know, experienced some weird behavior with, with large language models and long conversations or overloading the context window, uh, they can start to do, we'll say, funny things. Uh, it's just, it's, it's operating and guessing uh, without the, the information that it needed. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the general gist uh, we've talked about, you know, Tr tokens, uh, embeddings, transformers, everything I promised in the title of this talk. Um, let's talk a little bit to like, where do these models come from or how does, you know, how does training look? What is that process? Uh, so at a high level, to train the models, so getting all of these parameters and weights uh, figured out, starts with a huge amount of data. Uh, so this could be coming from general knowledge, so you know, think downloading the entire whole of Wikipedia, 
uh, and feeding that into the process. Uh, it could be coming from you know, large code databases if you want to develop a model that's, that's centered around kind of coding tasks uh, or you know, whatever else is relevant. Uh, that gets fed into a learning process. Uh, there's lots of different ways to approach this. Uh, sometimes you could do like a self, what's known as self-supervised learning, right? If I, give you, if I give you a book, I don't need to have uh, a labeled set of data that says, you know, given this input passage, this is what the next word should be because the next word is right there. So it's like if you were trying to learn or practice guessing what the next token should be in a, in a sequence, just put your thumb over a word in a book, read what is up, you know, goes up to that point, make your guess, see if you're right or wrong. Um, so that's sort of, you have unlabeled data and you're able to train on it. The output of all this uh, is what's known, uh, or kind of is a, a foundation model. Um, these are when you hear like GPT or Llama, uh, Falcon Claude, um, Mistral. These are companies that have put out or gone through the process to you know, taking these big general purpose uh, data sets, train these models, um, and a lot of these are available and open source for you to use. Now, open source in this case means you get the model uh, at the end, you don't necessarily have visibility into all of the data that went into training that model or what that learning process looked like, and there's some other things that could go into there. Um, but they do make a lot of those models available for, for general use, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, and the way I like to think about this, this general purpose foundational model is it's kind of like a new graduate who's just gone to four-year university, uh, and they've taken every class and read every book in the library. So they're very, very smart uh, on general knowledge. Uh, but they don't, they don't have uh, a lot of unique knowledge. So an example, like what could a foundational model do? Uh, if I was to ask it, you know, what's, uh, what's the capital of the United States? That's probably somewhere in that training data, and so it would be able to say, hey, it's you know, Washington, D.C. I could probably ask it to generate a checklist for changing the oil in my car. That's a common task, something that's probably available in that, that training data. Uh, it could do that. Now if I were to ask it, you know, what are the nuclear launch codes? Uh, hopefully not in that training data, and so hopefully, hopefully it pushes back. Um, or in some cases, models can do what's known as hallucination, where it will try to give me an answer, even though it doesn't have that knowledge, uh, very confidently give me an answer. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the fun things with, with LLMs. They're very polite. They want to they wanna answer you, uh, even if they don't know something. So uh, this is our, you know, again, think of it like a, like a generalist, uh, your, your really smart intern who's got all those classes. Uh, training these foundational models is not cheap. It, almost as costly as a four-year college degree. But ouch. No, um, these are, yeah, it, it takes, uh, you know, weeks or even months uh, and millions of dollars to train some of these very large uh, foundational models. So that's where there's, you know, companies like Meta putting out the Llama models. Uh, they're doing huge, huge investments in all the infrastructure and all the GPUs they need to train these models uh, and then, you know, putting those out to be available. Now let's say we've got this foundation model, it's very generalist. How can we make them more specialized? Let's say we want to train them around a domain-specific task or to have a specific behavior. This is where we can do something called fine-tuning, where we take that base model and then uh, do additional training steps uh, with kind of domain-specific data to tune it towards a specific behavior or task. Uh, this adds, you know, we'll either tweak those existing weights within the model or potentially add new layers uh, of parameters within the model. Uh, so an example here, let's take our foundational model uh, and let's take that new grad and have them go and read all of the historical text on Munchkin law and, and you know, history. Uh, and with that, we've, we can create a model that is effectively the mayor of Munchkin land. So uh, has that additional context, has that behavior, knows how to talk like a Munchkin. Um, and the fine-tuning a model is, is cheaper than you know, developing that foundational model from the ground up, uh, but it is still a costly uh, computational process. Uh, plus, you need to have uh, information or data to, to support that. Uh, another sort of uh, way we can tune these models uh, is with uh, what's known as reinforcement learning from human feedback. So let's get a human in the loop. So let's say we take that new Munchkin, layer mo Munchkin mayor we've just uh, fine-tuned, and we start giving him a bunch of prompts. So we say, hey, the witch is dead. How are we going to celebrate? And he says, ding dong, hey ho, sing it out loud, or however the song goes. So then we have some human assessors look at that result, you know, given the input, do we like it or not? Uh, that goes to a reward model, and then that goes back and updates and tweaks the model. And so through a number of iterations of this, you can start to refine that behavior uh, of your, your tuned model uh, with that human in the loop type feedback. Now, as you expect, when you start putting a human in the loop, this gets expensive as well and very time consuming. 
Uh, so something that can be done um, in certain cases, but maybe not, uh, not always the easiest thing to do. Um, it's also worth mentioning here with, with fine tuning, it, it makes sense if you have a, you know, this domain specific data is, is gonna be static, right? So I'm gonna say the historical Munchkin texts and laws don't change frequently. So if you wanna take, invest that time to go tune this model and, you know, kind of adjust that behavior, that may make sense. Uh, but let's say, you know, we don't need, we're not so worried about the behavior, but we want the model to have access to information to include uh, in its uh, generation tasks. Uh, and we have information that's constantly changing. Maybe we want it to have access to the daily news of Munchkin land or whatever's, you know, current out there. There's another uh, technique we can use, uh, which is known as retrieval augmented generation. Uh, this basically walking through the process here, it starts with the user submits a prompt. Uh, with that prompt, we go through a retrieval model, which then goes into a, a knowledge base where we've pre-populated it with all this data that we want to be able to incorporate uh, into the response. Uh, it extracts whatever the relevant uh, pieces of bits of info are in there. Whoops. Uh, then when we pass uh, that information on, so we pass whatever those retrieved bits of information are along with our prompt, that's now all within the context window of our, our pre-trained you know, standard model. And so now the uh, generated response we're gonna get from that model has that information incorporated into the context window. And so this is a way we can very you know, regularly update that knowledge base with the daily Munchkin post or you know, whatever, whatever we want this, uh, this RAG system to, to be connected to. Uh, and so we're able to have more, uh, more timely information. And sort of uh, shouldn't be, maybe it's, maybe it's surprising, I don't know. Uh, under the hood, we're using uh, embeddings as a way for storing uh, and retrieving this information. So uh, let's say I had you know, a, a book or something that I wanted to, to uh, store into this database. We would go and we would chunk it up maybe on a paragraph basis, maybe on a page basis, how you chunk it kind of matters. We can apply uh, the embeddings model to each of those chunks. And so then we have that embeddings vector that you know, puts it out into this embedding space. And so later on when you know, my user enters a prompt, we take that prompt, we go into the embedding space. We find, oh, hey, what, what embeddings are close, you know, semantically relevant uh, or similar to this prompt? And then that's how we're able to get the information we want uh, and not just everything. So embeddings, uh, part of the magic that make it happen. Okay, so I'll just do a quick time check here. So just to kind of recap here, we've, uh, we've got tokens, we've got embeddings, we've got uh, transformers, we've got fine tuning, we've got rag. Hopefully that gives you enough you know, words to take to your next dinner party and you can impress or annoy all your friends, uh, sound like you know what you're talking about. Um, but now I wanna turn uh, attention over to, you know, if you walk out of here and you're like, man, I just really wanna go start playing with these large language models at home and get my hands on them. Uh, look at a couple of sort of open source projects out there uh, and places to go to get started uh, with, with that uh, journey. Uh, so the first place to point to is, is Hugging Face. Uh, this has sort of become the de facto place uh, for open source AI models. Uh, so they host all these models uh, free to download and use. Uh, you can see right now I took the screenshot uh, last night. So they have over 600,000 models. Uh, so a lot to choose from. In fact, it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot of these foundational models and then people have gone and fine tuned them for various tasks and uploaded those as well. So you're kind of wading through a sea of, of stuff. Uh, they do have a leaderboard which you can go to if you're looking for you know, what is the latest and greatest, but the latest and greatest is changing day by day, week by week. Uh, there's, just, there's so much happening in this space. Um, but a good resource there, uh, and they also have a lot of models beyond just uh, like text-based large language models. There's other, other modalities, so dealing with like audio generation, image generation, uh, all that kind of stuff as well. So that's where you can find a model. We have a model, but the model alone uh, is not everything we need. We also need software that can then run uh, and perform in what we call inferencing on that model. Uh, so there's sort of two uh, big inferencing engine, uh, or there, there's several out there, but two I'll, two I'll call out here, uh, open source projects. So one is Llama CPP, excuse me. Um, very active development uh, there. Uh, support for both CPU uh, and GPU inferencing. Uh, and this is a great one. It's really well suited for like, if you wanna run something at home on your, your laptop, uh, a, a GPU poor environment, maybe your desktop or something where you know, you've got a GPU but it's not one of these monstrous uh, AI specific GPUs. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, backend for that. Uh, and then another one that's out there uh, is VLLM. Uh, so this one is, is focused around uh, GPU inferencing. 
uh, has much more kind of feature rich in terms of like parallelism so you can spread out the work uh, and concurrency for enabling more users so you can have multiple concurrent users submitting requests at the same time and they don't step on each other. Uh, so this one is more well suited for kind of a larger multi-user production type environment. So those are the inferencing engines, but we still need kind of one more layer, uh, and that's something, and VLLM actually includes part of this, but uh, what we'll call a, a, you know, the server, how, how are we going to interact or interface with this inferencing engine? So a popular one uh, out there is something called Olama. Uh, this under the hood uses the Llama CPP, uh, the, the name didn't give it away, uh, as the underlying inferencing engine. Uh, great place I would recommend if you're looking to get started and wanted to sort of uh, tinker and experiment uh, with some of these models. It, it took me five minutes to get this installed, have a model downloaded uh, and be up and running uh, right there from the command prompt and maybe three, three commands to get it done. So a fool like me can handle it. I'm sure uh, y'all be doing much more amazing things. Uh, it does include a, a command line interface. Um, there's also a lot of other uh, like UIs out there in the open source space that you can connect to it. Uh, or uh, they also have a Python library if you want to get in there and do some programming around it. So you're basically using it as the back end to host that model and then you can interact with it through an API. Uh, so again, great for local experimentation. Uh, I was impressed with that, the, the installation, you know, one click, pick the model, it reached out to the hugging face or, or wherever it's getting those models from uh, and you're up and running. And I think it supports, they have like 20 something models. Uh, so it, it's a good place too to look if you're like, what, out of these 600,000 models on hugging face, where should I begin? Uh, this kind of down selects it to some of the, the best ones out there. Uh, another one that's out there that I like uh, was GPT for all. Uh, similar, you know, support for all your major OSs and easy installation. Um, you boot it up, you pick a model, it's kind of the same story of it reaches out to the cloud, downloads that model locally, uh, and then you're running it locally. Uh, nice thing about this one is it did have a nice uh, graphical user interface right out of the box. So if you're just, if you're looking to like, go and, you know, do some Pythoning and experimenting with your things, I'd recommend Olama. If you're just trying to get a, a model up and running, uh, locally, GPT is, uh, for all, is a good choice. Yes, sir. Yes, excellent choice. I'm, I'm gonna actually go to the third one because I can address this. Uh, this is, uh, the, the question was, uh, for folks in here, like, why would you wanna locally host these models uh, versus going out to, you know, OpenAI or, or Bing or Copilot? There's all these, these cap capabilities out there. Uh, and this really comes back to uh, on the defense side of things where Defense Unicorns works. We're dealing with a lot of sensitive information and so trying to, uh, you, can't, you can't go and, and chat with uh, you know, a, an internet facing API and start sharing that kind of sensitive information. And so you do need to be able to bring that into uh, isolated classified uh, type environments. And so that's where you need to be able to host the model yourself, uh, bring those capabilities in. The things that we at home you know, have fun with ChatGPT because we can access it. Um, but this is self-hosting. And this is where, I'm uh, glad you, you set me up for this one. This is where Leapfrog AI, uh, the project uh, I work on, uh, excels. So this is uh, kind of different from the previous Olam and, and GPT for all. This is more designed for that kind of enterprise scale uh, and really focused on air-gapped environment. And so we, we build Leapfrog so it deploys uh, on, on a Kubernetes stack. We have something uh, that we developed out called Unicorn Delivery Service, basically provide a secure way to run the software, meeting all of these security controls and things that are necessary in DoD type uh, applications, uh, and the ability to package up everything and take it into environments where you don't have internet connectivity. So like with Olama, when I boot up Olama, I type in a model I want, it's expecting a ubiquitous internet connection to reach out and, and pull that model down. Uh, if we're operating in places where you don't have that internet, as the national security missions often are, uh, you have to bring that model in with you. Uh, and so packaging that and, and deploying that is part of what we do. So uh, it's, all, it's open source and built on open source tools. We actually use VLLM under the hood. Uh, we have GPU capabilities and Llama CPP uh, when we only have uh, uh, CPU targets. Um, so uh, another project uh, that I would recommend checking out uh, and happy to, to talk more after this. Uh, and there's so many more. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad I put this slide just as a summary. Uh, so like local AI, Llama chat, lots of Llama themed things, uh, Jan AI, Rubra, uh, the list goes on. So hopefully that gave you a few kind of starting points if you're interested in you know, going and, and 
dabbling, um, but there's, it, it's endless and there's always new projects popping up all the time. Uh, and with that, I am at the last minute here, so I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed this as much uh, as I had fun putting these slides together. Uh, I will uh, go hang out in the back of the room because uh, I think they want me to get off stage, but uh, thank you. <laughs>